Well, well, cool. We can get started. Um, hey, everyone. Welcome. Hope you're enjoying the event so far. Uh, this is a really big room, and it's just me here. So um, if you don't mind, could you scoot in? We could make it a, a little more um, intimate. I wasn't expecting to be such a, <laughs> such a big room. I um, figured it would make it easier for, for dialogue. Um, I promise I don't bite. <laughs> Awesome, thank you. Cool, well like I said, I'm Ben. Hope you're enjoying the event so far. I'm here to talk about building the IDE Golden Path. Um, this is a talk that I've done before. I did it at PlatformCon, which is a virtual conference around platform engineering, but I only had 15 minutes to do the talk, so I'm really excited to have a little bit more time to really get into the details and talk about what this actually means. Um, it seems like at this event so far, even, there's been a good amount of interest in managed developer environments and, and IDE environments. We've, we have a booth, we're sponsoring the event, and we've seen some really good conversations so far. The, the folks at Loft did a really good talk on dev containers early this morning. I'm not sure if some of you all caught that. Um, but it seems like, in general, there's a lot of interest in the space, so super excited to, to talk about that. Um, before we get into it, I just wanted to share a little bit of details about me. Um, I'm Ben. I've spent the last six years working in various developer tools companies, the last four at Coder, and prior to that I worked at a company called CodeStream, where it was essentially an in-IDE annotation tool, which changes the way kind of developers collaborate. So super interesting, um, but I spent a lot of time thinking about developer workflows, uh, introducing new tools and new workflows to developers, and what that process is, is like. I, I also spent a lot of time talking and thinking about developer environments. Uh, one of my favorite developer environments was a Raspberry Pi that I had in my dorm room. I had it hooked up to the university network, and from any machine I could connect to that file system or use VS Code in the web browser to get my work done. So I didn't have to upload my work to Google Drive. It was a really nice workflow where all of my code was stored remotely and I could connect from, from any client. But um, nevertheless, I spent a lot of time thinking about developer environments, now more a little bit more on the, the enterprise side, but it's still something I, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about. I work for a company called Coder.com. I'm actually not going to spend much time today talking about Coder.com, but I, I do product there. And I joined Coder from the managed VS Code in the web browser experience. We uh, have a project called Code Server. It runs VS Code in the web browser. That's how I found Coder, and that's where I'm, I'm here today. Um, and I live out in Austin, Texas. That's also where Coder's headquarters are. We run um, monthly platform engineering and, and programming meetups there, too. So if you're ever in town, Feel free to, to check meet up and um, come, come visit us and come say hi. So what I'm here to talk about today is there's a gap in most developer platforms. And this is kind of a functional gap. And when you really walk through the developer journey and what a kind of developer life cycle is, you'll identify it relatively quickly. But first, I wanted to talk a bit about what a traditional developer platform looks like in the platform engineering model. Typically, a developer goes to the platform and they interact with something either with its app templates or infrastructure templates that make it a lot easier for them to spin up an app or spin up an infrastructure without really having to think about configuration. Um, once they pick those templates, the developer gets a lot of things for free provided through your platform or provided through your service. They get CI CD pipelines, they have um, maybe test infrastructure, they get observability. A uh, recent thing that we've seen a lot as well is, is security building security tooling into the developer platform, especially uh, in this kind of economy, we see security tooling being really, really beneficial and really uh, important in kind of corporate environments and that being aligned with the way developer platforms are being built. Uh, and you also get environments. You get staging environments and you get production environments. So the developer interacts with this platform, they don't have to think about these opinions and they get these tools for free. Um, there is a gap though, and you probably guessed it by the, the title of the talk. It's the, the IDE, or kind of more correctly, the developer's inner loop. And this is essentially everything from when the developer clones their code to when they commit it back into source control. So these are the, the physical devices that they're using to write their code. It could be a Windows desktop, it could be a managed virtual machine, it could be a, a MacBook. Uh, it, it's also the tools that developers are using, whether it's a programming language like Python, a um, 
kind of uh, platform like Docker for spinning up uh, reproducible environments or uh, frameworks like Spring. And then it's also the editor, the, the IDE. So there's IntelliJ, VS Code, Eclipse, to name a few. But all of these things are pretty fundamental to the way that developers work. But it's not considered much when you're building a developer platform. Uh, so that kind of goes into who's this talk for. Not everyone needs to build an IDE golden path and think about these inner loop environments. In particular, this talk is really oriented towards platform engineers and people in developer experience who are struggling with one of two problems. The, the first is you maybe have already standardized your environments, but they're, they're old and they're legacy. So this could be a virtual desktop for contractors and, and remote employees. These could be a, a, a locked down Windows machine for uh, any time a developer needs to install a tool, they need to contact IT. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of pain points here. The one that we kind of like to think about and talk about the most is developer attrition, which is developers actually leaving their jobs at one of these kind of more regulated organizations to work with better tools. Of course, there's a lot of things that developers uh, kind of uh, stick around for in an environment, and the tools is just one of them. But really, it's really difficult to ask developers to, to do modern things if they're not given modern tools. Uh, the, the other problem is kind of on the opposite side of things, and it's very likely that you may actually be experiencing both of these uh, problems. And it's, you haven't fully standardized your development, and it, the kind of status quo of how software development works is a little bit of a wild west. You have Windows machines, maybe some developers have Linux, some developers are programming on cloud VMs, and then with the, the introduction of Apple Silicon, you're now having to support both Intel Max, M1, M2, uh, and then also trying to onboard contractors and letting them bring their own devices. So that's just on the raw like physical hardware side. It can get really difficult to create a good IT story there. Um, beyond that, developers have preferences around what editors they use. IntelliJ and VS Code are the, the two most popular and the two that we see more commonly. But there's also Eclipse and Visual Studio, and creating a good story and a good platform around that is, is really difficult, especially compounded by the fact that you're trying to support Eclipse, Visual Studio, IntelliJ on all of these different types of hardware. Um, beyond that, there's, there's cloud infrastructure. So you might have databases, source control, pipelines, clusters, API gateways, artifact management stories that you need to get to work on all of these editors. And you need to get them to work on all of these physical machines. Um, let alone that the tools and IDE plugins that developers are using. So when you're kind of tasked at something as a um, platform engineer or developer experience engineer, say around rolling out GitHub Copilot, the, the expectations versus the reality of what that process looks like can get really, really challenging um, when you're working with all of these different kind of levels of, of complexity. It's a little bit of a, a wild west. Uh, and this is where platform engineering comes in. So, I mean, for those who of you are familiar, platform engineering is the idea of thinking about the product you uh, offer to developers in kind of a product management methodology. It's surveying developers, it's creating an, an MVP, essentially all the things that a, a product manager would do around how can we roll this out in a, in a clear way uh, can, can help with managing IDEs. So you can essentially start to treat editors as part of your platform and as part of your product, where essentially developers can come into your platform with an app template or an infrastructure template. When they do a Git clone, it's actually happening with your IDE golden path. And it's essentially your prescribed model of this is how the inner loop of software development um, can be done in an organization. And this doesn't have to support every use case. This can be a golden path for a specific prescribed set of use cases. And then when it comes along to the developer committing, there's a lot more confidence that when what the code developers are committing in, uh, from their editor will work well in CI, test environments, observability, and essentially because the developer is going through the pathway the whole time, a lot of the things on the right will behave a lot better for the developers as well. Um, I think another important question here is why now? Everyone has a bunch of competing priorities as a, as a platform engineer. And given you are here, it means there's probably something you're, you're curious about around building a, a developer experience around editors. Um, and the, the TLDR here is that the editor is a critical part of the software development lifecycle. There, there are a lot of surveys that show how much time a developer spends in their editor, but it's, it's pretty obvious. What, what a developer does most of the time is writing code. Yes, they're thinking about infrastructure and, and app templates and, and, and things like that, but if the developer's IDE environment is not productive and well thought out, then the rest of the lifecycle is uh, going to be a lot more challenging to make productive as well. 
Um, some mature developer experience groups have been thinking about this problem for years, and I'm going to talk about some organizations that we've worked with and a lot of organizations that we haven't worked with who have already built tools around um, the, the editor environment. Uh, this is not, however, a presentation around ROI or pitching something like this to an executive. We spend a lot of time thinking about this. We spend a lot of time writing about this. This is more of kind of a practitioner handbook on rolling this out to engineers, but it's not about how to pitch an idea like this to executives. If this is something that's interesting to you, though, you should come talk to us at our booth. We do spend a lot of time kind of building these, these value stories. Um, but at the end of the day, kind of for the practitioner, that we do have a few points on why now is the right time to uh, kind of focus on this. And it would be if you're kind of dealing with one of these three uh, initiatives already. The, the first is driving platform adoption. And the kind of challenge that we hear from some platform engineers is we've built this platform and developers aren't using it. There's probably a lot of problems um, there, but, but one of them is you really need to make your platform as easy as possible to get into code and deploy. Uh, a lot of organizations think about this as time to first commit. There's, there's also plenty of uh, Dora metrics that you can impact through something like this, but really all of the best developer experiences and developer tools are really easy to install. It's a, a, a simple click or a simple CLI command and a developer can get in. And if you're building this platform where then a developer has to clone, install scripts, install Python, and deal with a bunch of dependencies, it's not going to lead to a lot of um, adoption. You do need to be able to show developers that the platform is kind of magic and actually solves a, a problem. Um, second is around developer tool rollout. Um, whether this is rolling out a, a new tool to your organization, whether it's um, Docker or a Gen AI tool like GitHub Copilot, or maybe an internal tool that you want developers to start using, it can be really difficult to distribute this tool across operating systems, across editors, and by building a golden, um, an IDE golden path, you can essentially have that cohort be the first cohort to use new tools. Maybe you aim to support other environments down the road, but if you need a secure way to introduce Docker to your organization or a secure way to introduce GitHub Copilot, the best way to do that is through one single method and bring kind of developers in to, to that as well. Uh, the third that's kind of important is, is securing environments. Well, this is more of kind of an, an IT problem around uh, rolling out patches to, to machines, or if it's more around kind of uh, thinking about how artifact downloads work inside your organization, whether you're using something like JFrog Artifactory or Sonatype Nexus. Um, the ability to kind of govern and, and control how artifact downloads occur in, in your um, environment can, can help a lot. And this is essentially a, a modern way to achieve a lot of these things that traditional IT teams would solve through, through tickets. So uh, we're going into dark mode. We're going to get a little more serious now, and we're going to start talking about kind of some, some strategies that we've seen work. Uh, for, for the agenda, first I'm going to give an overview of the dev, dev environment landscape. There are a lot of tools out there, and there are a lot of categories of tools. So I split it up into three categories. Gartner splits it up in, in a different way as well. Um, uh, after that, we're going to go over some case studies. And these are organizations who have operationalized their IDE environments. They think about it as a product, they start applying platform principles to it, and some of them have written a blog post on how they did it and what works and, and what doesn't. So hopefully there will be some patterns that you'll be able to take there and apply to your organization and your problems. Next, we have a maturity model, and we have different stages of rolling this out. We've been around for about uh, four years now, uh, more like six years now, and have really started to learn what works and what doesn't when introducing new tools, new editors, and kind of an IDE golden path to your organization. And also, kind of finally, we have some resources and some gotchas that you should look out for as you're going through this, this journey. So kind of for an overview of the landscape, there are typically three ways to do modern developer environments. And this may seem um, a little obvious, but there's local dev environments, there are hybrid dev environments, and there are remote dev environments. Uh, with local, you can think of tools like Docker, Vagrant, and local stack. These are replicating what would normally happen in a cloud on a single machine. And you can think of it as almost mocking what a, a, a full cluster would be. There's also um, micro K8s if you want to run a Kubernetes cluster. There are a lot of ways to completely replicate what's happening in a, in a data center onto a developer's machine in a consistent and secure way. There, there are also a lot of advantages to doing that, for starters, if you're um, on an airplane, right? You can have a, a fully replicable environment. Uh, th there are also some challenges, which is it doesn't necessarily solve developers connecting with different operating systems or having locked down machines. 
Hybrid environments are also super interesting. These are kind of more cloud native centric companies, or at least the way I'm talking about it is kind of more cloud native centric companies and tools. Uh, think about like Tilt, Octeto, Garden, Scaffold, and they have this model where you are doing your programming locally, but a lot of the actual computation is being synced up to a remote Kubernetes cluster. These uh, are pretty visionary companies, and they also have really strong opinions on how to do CI, staging, dev, test, prod. So they're actually trying to solve the, the full pipeline. So if you kind of want a one-stop solution on how to do cloud-native development, a lot of these hybrid environments do a really good job there, where developers can still have their local machine, but it's syncing up to a remote environment for them to be able to preview your changes. And then finally, what I have kind of highlighted in, in purple here are remote dev environments. And this is essentially a local editor with a remote back end. So you can think of maybe back in the day, there was AWS Cloud9, which was um, kind of one of the first remote editors. Uh, there's also um, other kind of more modern ones, such as GitHub Code Spaces, Gitpod, um, Loft, and then Coder as well. This is what we do in, in Coder. And the reason why I have this highlighted in purple is just because I spend the most time thinking about this one on the right. So um, um, that's probably what I'm going to be spending most of the time around is kind of best practices for applying remote developer environments to your organization. However, I think there's still a lot of like value in some of these themes around introducing tools to um, local and, and hybrid environments as well. And at Coder, we're also kind of interested in branching out and exploring these other two on the, on the left, um, particularly kind of hybrid and, and, and local. Uh, we also have a talk called Modernizing the Developer Runtime, and it tries to give each one of these equal weight. So um, the, the, the slides for this presentation should be available to you all afterwards, and you can kind of get, get into this, or you can, you can Google it. It's, it's a pretty good talk around kind of weighing the differences between local, hybrid, and remote dev environments, some of the pros and cons, what environment each one works in. Uh, I'm not here today to prescribe a solution. I'm just going to be talking about remote mostly because that's where we spend most of our time. So um, onto cloud developer environments or remote developer environments. Um, cloud developer environment, CDE, is the term that Gartner gives this, this category. I think it's, it's pretty good. The, the one um, kind of caveat here is that uh, Coder, as well as a couple of other tools and vendors, also work on-prem and, and air-gapped. So the term cloud can sometimes be uh, a, a little misleading because we don't actually host any of the any of the source code. But as kind of a, a theme, the, the benefit here to developers is there's consistent and secure tooling um, through container and VM images. You, you might be thinking, well, yes, but I could run a container image or a VM image locally as well. And you absolutely can, but then you're running into a bunch of intricacies with each developer's operating system. It's a lot easier to get consistency with a cloud provider as opposed to uh, 15 different types of laptops, desktops, virtual desktops, and kind of network um, conditions, whereas it's a lot easier to do something like this in uh, a cloud or a, a managed network, essentially. Uh, the benefit to developers is that they can get fast networking and access to cloud resources. So if you're a developer working against a database, that database can be in the cloud. You can work against it just fine. If you're doing an NPM install, you're not uh, necessarily bottlenecked by your slow Wi-Fi connection because all of that computation is happening in the, in the cloud. There are also speed benefits. You can do fast builds and, and tests, but, but really your mileage will vary here on how builds and tests perform in these environments uh, based on a few factors. Uh, for, for starters, MacBooks are really powerful, so trying to get as fast of a build on a um, cloud server as possible, but it'll require things like build caching and, and, and whatnot. So you can get really, really fast remote builds probably faster, well, definitely faster than a, a local, but the, the main benefit to developers across the board is fast networking and, and cloud, cloud access in these environments. And, and finally, for the developers, the, the coding feels local. And what, what I mean by this is that they're able to use their desktop IDE as a front end and essentially the remote uh, environment as a back end. So modern editors such as VS Code and, and JetBrains support this kind of hybrid approach through SSH. And this is what remote developer environments or cloud developer environments rely on. So any editor that can support SSH can create this experience that feels very, very local, unlike a, a remote desktop but uh, the, the back end and source code is still running remotely. Um, additionally, these also support like web editors as well. So if you wanted a fully web-based solution, you'd be able to do that uh, as well through a, through a cloud developer environment. Um, so a little bit about what we do at Coder. We are essentially building an open source ecosystem around cloud developer environments. So on the top is our product called Coder. It's, um, 
the, the platform that kind of does it all, it, it does orchestration, so a developer can click in, it creates, uh, hits new workspace, it'll create a, a new workspace on your compute somewhere. But, but beyond that, we built a bunch of open source projects that you can use with or without coders. So if you're building your own platform or even using one of our competitors, you can still plug in one of these um, open source tools as part of the, the equation, right? So we have um, Code Server, which is VS Code in the in the web browser. We launched that in 2019. Uh, it, in 2019, a lot of um, the the Node modules did not belong um, in in the web browser, but we we did it anyway. Um, we we have some tools around building dev containers, and um, uh, that this is essentially what we what we do at Coder. We have an enterprise model where we ch charge for security and get governance and, and enterprise features. So that's that's our business model. But if you're a, a small team or up to 100 users, you can use our open source for free, and we don't want to monetize that. Cool. So on to who actually uses these things. Uh, I think a kind of running joke is that a lot of internal developer tools at Google end up kind of getting spun up and turned into its own category and its own product. And that's definitely the case here. Google has an internal tool called, I believe, Cider that does these kind of remote um, instances when developers onboard so they don't have to install any tools on their laptop. I couldn't find a, a public blog on how Cider works, but if anyone here was a Googler, I'd love to talk about you uh, talk with you about this afterwards. I think it's super interesting. Um, it, it was definitely a project that, that Google started. Meta does this as well. Um, Slack and Uber have really good public blog posts about how they do remote development or cloud development. Uh, and it's really interesting to read these two because each of these organizations has their own um, kind of model that they apply to it. There's not really a one size fits all approach to how to do remote development. Each of these does their own. Uh, and then the folks in purple here also use cloud developer environments. And um, I'm lucky to say that they're also coder users and coder customers. So it's been really cool to work with some of them over the last, um, few years, and the ones underlined have done a, a public case study with us as well. So you can learn kind of what problem they set out to use cloud developer environments for, what architecture they ended up using, and what worked, what didn't, and what are the kind of uh, business benefits to it as well. So um, the, these things are being used. Platform teams have introduced this, and there are some patterns that exist to roll these out at, at very large scales of, of developers. So on to the stages. We uh, kind of def split this up into four different stages of introducing this tool from I, I have an idea to let's get this running for um, as many developers as, as possible. The, the, the first stage is building a universal image. And for those kind of with a cloud native background, you uh, might be a little concerned here because I'm essentially talking about adding multiple languages and dev tools into a single image. And, um, it's not great, but it, it works really well for this particular use case. And I have a slide that kind of explains why. Um, beyond that, you can create a model where developers can bring their own dependencies into the platform. So they can say, I need to use Python, Java, Docker, Node, um, and these specific versions. The platform builds that environment, it caches that environment, and then the developer is able to get into that and use that for their, um, for their work. Next. Um, there's an interesting model here where different developer teams and different developer groups can actually bring in their existing infrastructure, whether it's a cluster or a VM, into this model and use that for software development as well. Super fancy. We're working with some of our customers on this now, and it's, it's been super, super fun. Uh, and finally, there's some edge cases, and this is what I was talking about around the gotchas. Uh, the reason I have this as four is not because it's, it's not possible to do, but starting with these doesn't make a lot of sense, frankly, uh, unless you have a really clear problem statement on why remote development needs to work for Windows or Android development. Frankly, a, a local or even a hybrid approach is, is probably better. It's just not what remote development is kind of built for it, at this point. Um, there's just a, a lot of kind of challenges there, and remote development works a lot better for kind of other, other use cases. Uh, so universal images. Uh, a universal image is essentially the idea of building a container or a VM image that in contains a lot of tooling that developers um, will, will essentially need. So a, a good way to start here would be running a survey, uh, asking developers what tools do you need, what tools do you struggle with the most, and building an image with a lot of those things pre-installed. So when a developer gets into it, it's not like they're in this bare environment that doesn't have any of their tools. Most of the things that they're used to using on their desktop will work in this. Um, there are dev container images, which is something that um, Microsoft builds and maintains, which is a great place to start. They build universal images for the popular programming languages, and they also have one that's just called a, a universal 
universal image, which in contains a, a lot of different programming languages in, in one. And uh, my, my advice here is to really max do three of these images. And it, the, the reason is that it becomes really, really difficult to manage after three. You want to be able to deliver a, a quick win to engineers. And if you have to maintain 15 or 5 or 20 images for different use cases, it's going to be really challenging to understand what's working and what's not. Whereas with, with two or three images, it's really easy to get a, a great experience for certain tasks and get feedback from your engineers and figure out what's, what's working there. Uh, the reason why I'm starting with universal images is there needs to be a, a quick win or kind of an aha moment for a developer. And if you're a developer and you get into a remote environment and you write a Python script and it compiles and you push it to Git or you clone your company's mono repo and it just works, then that's kind of the aha moment. It was I remember the pain of having to do this locally. This just worked well remotely. Um, another kind of uh, model that I, I like to use here is say you're a, a, an engineering manager and you need to write up a quick script between meetings. This should be an image that works for something like that, but not necessarily the most complex edge case development that's happening in, in your organization. So it should be something that just works most of the time for specific things. The, the second phase is allowing developer teams to bring in their own um, requirements into environments. Um, there's plenty of open standards here. We uh, support them all with our product. Other products do too. The, the most popular one here is dev containers. And dev containers is essentially a wrapper of a, a Docker file that's a little bit more developer friendly, where if a developer says, I need Java, Python, Go, Ruby, they don't have to be writing a Docker file. They can essentially just be kind of appending a, a JSON. So it's, it's a little bit easier, and they don't have to worry about a lot of the um, uh, the, the containerization nuances that, um, that we've, we've all been through. Um, beyond that, it's, it's really helpful to start focusing on enablement at this stage, and this is why I have this as the second phase and not the first, is trying to get teams to change their behavior before you give them an aha moment isn't really practical or useful because everyone has competing priorities. Um, with that being said, you do need to provide enablement. You need to provide example dev containers that, that work inside your organization. They have to be images that, that work, projects that work. And you should also do some form of enablement here uh, on, on a, maybe a weekly or monthly session to answer questions and help people kind of convert into one of these standards where perhaps their repo prior to this was um, something that was a little bit more, more manual. And, um, and finally, you can still use artifact management and uh, vulnerability scanning at this stage. So if you're thinking uh, having developers self-serve tools is, is pretty concerning, you can still enforce um, these environments to download artifacts from the proper place and kind of use all of your cloud-native security best practices on these dev container environments. So this doesn't have to be a wild west. You can add it into your existing cloud-native security model. This is where things get a little bit more advanced. This is essentially allowing a developer group, such as um, perhaps the data science organization, to bring in their own cluster into your remote development platform. There's, there's a lot of reasons um, folks want to do this. Uh, the main one that we see, honestly, is folks are, are used to an existing file system that they're able to get on VMs or um, uh, on, their, on their desktop that they need to, to get running in a cloud environment, and they need that cloud environment for kind of an, an onboarding purpose. Another is maybe a group has their own Kubernetes namespace that they're already deploying against, and they, start, they want to start running dev workloads there as well. Um, the, the final use case here is around data science. If you have a, a remote data set, you can deploy coder uh, or a kind of cloud infrastructure next to that data set and use that to do um, development. The, the benefit for devs is the same as it was before. You, they can have a one click into their editor. They don't have to really manage the compute anymore. They just can get into their editor and, and work. And the main benefit here is if you already have patterns for dev, CI, staging, and prod, you can kind of retrofit the dev environment into the existing infrastructure to uh, match that level of parity. Um, there, there are some edge cases. Um, around remote development. The reason I even mention this is because we actually spend a lot of time supporting this and working on this. This is something that's really interesting to us, is kind of what is the next area of 
remote development or building the, the IDE golden path. And really this is around having shared infrastructure, whether it's like a staging database or a VM that multiple people are kind of logging into and collaborating on. Um, Windows development is, is a big one. So maybe folks are carrying around two laptops uh, and this is, this is very real and they need to pull up their Windows laptop and do certain things in their um, Linux laptop and virtualization isn't a reason because of a bunch of kind of things going on. Um, and essentially, using remote developer environments for Windows is becoming increasingly common. We hear it in probably about like a third of the calls that we have with, with users at this point. Um, but it's not entirely there yet. So we're doing a lot of things and the industry is doing a lot of things to make Windows work a lot better. But it's not something I would necessarily start with. Uh, and, and finally, there's kind of this, this edge idea where um, developers are running some things locally and then maybe the builds are happening remotely, right? A developer is doing their, their local Android development and then the build happens remotely, happens really fast and then it sinks back into the developer's machine. This is something we're really, really interested in. We've actually seen a lot of our users build scripts and kind of port forwarding hacks and, and things like that to achieve these outcomes. So it's, it's, it's happening, people are doing it, but um, it's definitely kind of on the edge of what's possible today. So we're building towards it, wouldn't recommend starting with it, but the, the goal here is to support as many of these use cases as possible. Because at the end of the day, the, the goal here is to um, not, not only centralize, but provide developers with a, a good experience. Cool. Um, a note on enablement. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but marketing and enablement for developer tools is super underrated. I think there's a really strong belief that if we build this tool, developers are going to just change their existing workload, move into this, and everyone's going to be happy. And I think enablement plays a really, really big role in this, and it doesn't get talked about enough. However, it's really easy to do enablement poorly, which is having a loudspeaker, telling developers uh, to change their behavior, and not really listening to, to engineers. Um, so there's, there's a lot of thoughts here, and this isn't necessarily just around how to do development, but a few quick thoughts here on how you're communicating this to the developer. Um, to start, the, the main benefit that we've seen when talking to engineers about this is this lets you use new tools, whether it's Copilot, Docker, uh, believe it or not, Linux. Uh, a lot of these tools aren't available to developers or they're very, very tricky to do in some of um, these large organizations. So by, be, by telling developers, just go into this and you can use these tools and it's, it's free and it's fast, um, can be a really, really strong selling point. Um, next is around speed. You can build faster builds, clones, et cetera. And, and then third, this should never be something that's enforced in your organization. That, that just means that it'll, it'll, it'll fail, um, frankly. The, the main thing is you should be building tools for developers who, who want it. And if they want it um, and you're really closely working with them in kind of a, a product management model, um, the, the, you, you'll see success. Cool. Um, so to summarize, building an, an IDE golden path, or kind of more um, clearly, building a golden path around remote development really solves for two things. Uh, first, it's being able to essentially roll out modern and secure tooling for engineers in a pretty complex uh, landscape. And, and the second is dev environment standardization, right? If, you're, uh, if, you, if you face problems around having to support so many different models of um, dev environments, it can be really challenging to, to, to get anything done. Uh, the, the main TLDR of this, of this talk is not to boil the ocean. There's a lot of ways to think about this problem. Um, what I've described has been what's worked well for, for us and some of the, the, the users that we showed on the, the screen. Um, but, but really, if, if you kind of treat the editor as a product and um, think pragmatically about how you're rolling it out, think pragmatically about how you're going to be marketing it, um, you'll be OK and, and developers will, will enjoy the, the product. Uh, like I said, we spent a lot of time thinking about this. We built a cloud developer environment maturity model, which um, we, we have up here. This is something that um, we've spent a lot of time thinking about, and there's a lot more content beyond just this, this talk. Um, with that, thank you. I think we have a, a little bit of time for, for questions. What I have here is a QR code to join our Discord where we can answer any questions that you might have if we don't get the time to, to talk about it here. But we're also at the booth, so. Uh, feel free to come by the expo hall and, and chat with us about this as well. Yeah. You can use the open source variants of, uh, well, JetBrains doesn't have an open source really, but you could use VS Codium 
for example. Yes. Yeah. Um, any editor that supports SSH or any editor that can be run as, as a web app can run with uh, most of these platforms, not just Coder. Most of these platforms can support anything with SSH and, and web apps. And Coder itself is open source as well. We're, we're AGPL licensed to protect us from the cloud providers, but. Unusual editors. Yeah, um, we, we, we work really well with a lot of the, um, uh, it's not open source, we work well with like these AI editors, so Cursor works well, VS Codium um, works well. There's, there's also these kind of open source remote desktop tools such as Chasm, um, so we work with, with Chasm as well, but really any editor that supports SSH. Uh, we see people using Jupyter with us as well. Any other questions? You say that uh, Mac M1, M2, M3 are so fast and uh, it's uh, hard to compare a virtual machine with it, as I understand. That's correct? Uh, it, it's more that um, I think for a while a lot of remote developer environments would advertise fast builds. Um, well, it would be significantly more expensive to get those builds in the cloud and rent that compute as opposed to, to purchasing it. So we, one of our value pops is fast builds, but it's not necessarily realistic um, because local hardware is getting very, very powerful. So I'm, I'm more around, let's center the narrative as you're talking about it to, to some of the other benefits outside of just the, the compute. Yeah. Um, with, with that being said, um, there, there are still cases where pulling a mono repo or um, running a workload locally is, is extremely difficult, especially when you're trying to replicate what happens in a data center, right, with a bunch of services talking to each other. So it, it really just depends on your, your workload. Yeah, so I think because my developers are uh, complaining that uh, their laptops are much more faster than the power VM we provide to build their software. Yeah, that's. That's honestly fair um, because, again, the, the, the MacBooks are very powerful um, and the, it's not that that com compute doesn't exist in the cloud, but it, it comes at a cost. With that being said, there are a lot of things you can do to get cloud VMs and cloud builds to work really well. We spend a lot of time thinking about this. As, um, the, the first is build caching, right? If you have a build cache in, um, in the cloud and you're running a build in a kind of environment right next to it, you're able to get something very, very fast as opposed to what you would be able to get locally. Yeah. Um, yeah, so developing, developer environment containers um, will only take you so far eliminating some of the uh, infrastructure and um, some nuances for a new software developers inside the company, but talking about developer productivity, um, how do you make the differentiation between catering to the masses and people that actually have uh, very good, like uh, talking about uh, key mapping, talking about specific snippets that people use and so on and so forth, including in, in development environment containers in your, in your supply chain of development environment containers, and um, ex expect not to have a single image for this developer that has very specific needs? Yeah, so is the question a developer has specific kind of workflows and personalization specific to their environment, how do you create a, a universal image that, sol that solves problems at scale? You can yeah. create a universal image for that because specific, the, the specific things, the key mappings and so on and so forth that the developer might have are very particular. It's a personalized yeah. development environment, right? So um, how do you make a case of including this when you have a team of 10xers or very mature software engineers that um, they have their own workflows for this. Yeah, um, yeah, two thoughts here. First, the way um, our platform works and, and a lot of other platforms in the space is the environment itself is ephemeral through the dev container, but the home disk is persisted. So if a developer has dot files or IDE settings or macros or scripts or whatever they're used to, they can bring those in. And um, all, all, all of these tools support dot files repos as well. So if someone has a dot files repo that they're used to applying to a VM, that could still be layered on top of one of these environments. Um, so there, there are ways to have the, the home directory and kind of the developer's file system have a lot of those IDE personalizations without impacting the universal image. Um, with that being said, this isn't necessarily a, a platform for 10Xers. Yeah. Um, we, we 
I, I don't necessarily like the term 10xers that much, but there, there are people who are very who have very specific workflows and, and feel productive and, and good. This is more about kind of building a, a tool for the masses as opposed to a, um, a few kind of snowflake use cases, so. Yeah, um, it really depends on um, the the platform engineer, frankly. So in um, in in our, in our product and in a lot of products, you can build images as complex as you want. So ours is actually uh, our definition of an environment is actually defined through Terraform. So you can mount secrets through Vault. You could. Um, connect your JetBrains to a central JetBrains license server, and you can build this very magical experience that's interconnected. And we uh, are constantly building roadmap to build this very great interconnected world. However, uh, most platform engineers are, are pretty busy and working on a lot of different things. So something that's also important to us is how do we um, unblock the developer and allow them to do this stuff themselves. So as I was mentioning, the, the, the home disk is persistent. It's not great, but if developers need to get secrets in, they can do a .env just like they would locally. And if you're a platform engineer and you really don't want that, you can write a policy against it. But if a developer wants to put a .env locally and use that for secrets management or bring in their own license to IntelliJ, they, they can as well. So um, you can get really, really magical with this. It's just a uh, it's just a lot of time, and at a certain point, um, there's there's not a, a large ROI in kind of integrating everything. My impression is that it's a very good approach for the companies who have a lot of junior developers, yeah. because it's the best way to uh, onboard them, learn the proper tools, uh, proper workflows, and get them to their productivity very fast. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, point. Um, and I would, I would totally agree. It's, it's great for junior developers in that kind of onboarding use case because it abstracts away a lot of the, the complexity of, of setup. Um, one addition, though, is we have seen a lot of more kind of Fang-like companies do this, too. Um, so like Netflix is one of our users, and the reason they do it is because their stack is just so complicated, right? Where, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, junior developers is a kind of the, an easier problem to solve with, with the tech, yeah. You mentioned the licenses, the GPM, uh, which is a strong component of license. Uh, I think we're quite not allowed to use that internally uh, in our company. Okay. Because we, we tend to build things on top of whatever we bring in. Yeah. So, so do you have any comments on that? Yeah, we, we can talk after. What we've, we've seen a lot of people build on top of us. Um, and a lot of our users do it. The main distinction is that um, we see folks building on top of us through our API and our SDK. They're not modifying the, the core product itself. So interacting with us um, through the API, we've seen people build CLI wrappers around um, our, our product. We've seen people build their own front end for it, but it's all a separate code base kind of, and keeping the, the main code base itself. However, we, we can talk after, and if the license is a problem, I'm sure we can figure something out. Yeah. Uh, with this code, uh, did you find you needed to change uh, the code base much or not before? To put VS Code in the web browser? This was uh, before I joined Coder, actually. But at the time, in 2019, VS Code was not designed to be put in the web browser. So we had to build a lot of patches around node modules and how those things interact in the browser as opposed to on, on, a, on a node runtime. Um, however, over time, Microsoft has been making modifications to VS Code to allow it to run in the web browser much more natively. So now our patch is very, very light on top of it. And Microsoft actually has their own um, CLI command. So if you do like code web or something, it'll start a web-based version of, of VS Code. And we actually have a lot of our users using that inside of Coder. So at the time, yes, it was really challenging. And um, a lot of people use it in production, but there were some kind of a lot of nuances there, and it, it was a, a very difficult engineering challenge. I wish I wish I could talk more about it, but I, I wasn't involved in that. Um, over time, however, it's become much more um, supported by Microsoft, in part because they had to make VS Code run well for code spaces. So. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, I just went to their talk actually earlier too. Um, I think the main difference with, with DevPod is that they have a local experience as well. So a developer can download this Mac OS client and spin up these local workloads. And I think that works really, really well for a, a single developer. They're also working on this enterprise version that lets you run um, these environments at scale in the cloud, but it's not something that's like publicly available yet. I know they um, have, 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 have some like internal docs about that. I'm sure they've talked to like some folks about it, but their um, enterprise readiness today isn't um, entirely there yet. And so they have the local version, they're, they're building an enterprise, and I think they're starting a lot more with the um, challenges of a single developer. And I think we're a lot more focused on solving this for like developers at scale from kind of a, a positioning standpoint. There, there are technology differences as well. We support Windows environments. We do things through Terraform, but um, I think that the positioning's more important here. They're they're doing a lot with dev containers though, which is which is cool because it helps us kind of unify on a standard. So if someone needs to migrate or um, uh, do work locally and then move to remote, it's not a a, a big overhaul for for users. Well, cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're at the booth um, over there, so please feel free to swing by. We have t-shirts, swag, everything, but uh, really appreciate it. This was fun.